to them. Um, some of my students tell me that they watch um, the lecture videos when they're in traffic. Um, because I guess they're normally in a bus or public transport um, in Sydney. Uh, students usually can't afford a car, I guess. So the time they spend commuting, hello, the time they spend commuting they can put to good use. And I was thinking today as I was stuck um, in the traffic, uh, what a great idea that is. That's just a waste of time that could be used well. Now, everyone hopefully has a whole lot of questions, is that right? Um, can I have, just by a show of hands, who would be, who is interest, who is here because they are interested in me talking about practical suggestions you can do to increase engagement? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. Can we have, who is interested in talking about flipped classrooms and how you can get students to watch the video? Uh, and is anyone interested in um, the notion of uh, community and ways of creating community? Community. So you're probably not so in. Yeah, how to foster community. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe we um, should start with this. And so for flipped, who has been already running flipped classrooms? Has anyone, does everyone know what a flipped classroom is? It's, it's jargon, I'm sure you do. The idea of flipping is turning on its head, turning over, going, doing something backwards. And the traditional idea of a university is that the lecturer is very important. And uh, the, the students, and the lecturer gets paid lots of money and is very, very serious and senior. And the students learn the most from the lecturer in lectures. And then underneath the lecturer are, are the tutors. And they're not as well paid or as highly respected or as well educated. And, uh, and there are more tutors. And then underneath that, uh, there are the students. Students' friends. They're not paid at all. And they're not very likely uh, at all to be very academic or wise, and underneath this are the students themselves. And students, in terms of value under the traditional model, get most value from turning up to lecturers where we, lectures, where we very um, senior people talk and share our wisdom, and get some value for attending shoots. Hi. Hello. Um, and then get little value perhaps from talking amongst friends and are not very useful themselves. But um, of course that's not actually true. That's just our model. So universities like my university, for example, in the old days, would put all of its effort into improving the lecture and what happens in the lecture. But when um, in students are interviewed and we um, find out where learning actually occurs, actually everything is backwards. So the students tend to learn most by themselves, often studying just before an exam. Their friends are very useful, and discussions before and after lectures and in corridors and playgrounds and when you're working on the assignments are very useful. The tutors help because they'll answer questions, they'll be talking, and very little learning actually happens in the lectures. Um, the lectures are normally just a placeholder. In, in my university, yours could be very different. A placeholder where they see the notes for the course, which tells them what they need to know, and then they can go away and study that themselves and actually learn it in their own time. But very little learning happens in lectures. In maths lectures, it tends to be the math person with their back to the students just writing on the board and the students copying it all down. And in other ones, it's just the lecturer talking and talking and perhaps the students take some notes and perhaps they don't. So the idea of a flipped classroom is you say, well, um, it turns out students learn the most from interacting and rather than he having things presented at them and them sitting there passively. And we have these highly paid lecturers who are supposedly really wise and talented. So why don't we use the lecturers and the time with the lecturers to be a discussion time and an interaction time and make it more like this sort of interaction with students and their friends. And instead of doing content um, dissemination, which is what happens in the old model, dissemination, which is just, um, in Bloom's taxonomy, this is teaching them things they need to know and perhaps things they need to understand. 
instead of doing knowing and understanding in the lectures, maybe we could do that some other way, because you don't need an expensive lecturer to do that. And instead, do the higher level skills in Bloom's taxonomy, like um, analysis and synthesis and reflection and all the, the higher metacognitive things we really want the students to do. Why don't we do that with the lecturer? Why don't we do that in the classroom? So the idea behind a flip class, as I'm sure you all know, is you give the students the content to learn on their own. And in your face-to-face -face sessions, you try and do higher value things. And that's a brilliant idea. And it's got all these appeals to it when you hear about it and think about your own learning. That's got all sorts of advantages. But it's got this massive disadvantage that I've sort of alluded to before if you've talked about it, if you've heard me talk, which is, um, the traditional way of doing that, which is I'll give the students the notes. In the, so first of all, before YouTube, you would give the students the notes in a flipped classroom. So here's all the notes. You guys study them in advance, and in the class we'll just discuss them. And actually in English and the humanities have been doing this successfully. Probably that's their traditional way of teaching, so it's a really good model. But in science and STEM, where I come from, and in the social sciences, um, that's not how we normally do it. So the problem with giving people the notes is they might not read them, or they might not do them. Now, my wife studied English literature, and I noticed she read the notes really diligently before each class. And I used to be amazed. I said, how come you're preparing for your classes in science? We don't do any preparation at all. We just turn up, well, I'm a blank slate, show me the material. And, and even if the lecturer gives us stuff in advance, we don't bother looking at it. We think we'll work it out in the class. Why do you do it? And she said, oh, it's really interesting. I really like it. I love reading this stuff. It's what I thought learning English would be like, sitting at home and reading things and thinking about it. So I really enjoy the whole process, and it matches my idea of what I thought English would be. And then if I do it, when I turn up to the class, I get a lot more value from the class. And if I don't do it, I don't get value from the class. And so I think um, there are two really good tips that I took away from that. One is, oh, three, sorry, expectations. She expected to do it. In movies where you see people studying English at university, this is what people do. Two was she got value from it. And pain if didn't do it. And three was um, it was pleasure in doing it. The, act the activity itself was actually pleasurable. Reading the notes and analyzing was interesting and she enjoyed it. So now these days, um, I think most people that do flip classrooms don't do it by handing the notes to the students. Instead, we normally give them a video. And perhaps it's a video of us teaching the class or someone from Stanford or MIT teaching the class. We say, before you turn up to the lecture, watch this video. And then in our class, we'll discuss and build on the video. So the preparation the students are supposed to do is normally a video or, or, or multimedia in some way or mixed media in some way. With the idea of making it more interesting. Now, going back to the thing that I sort of alluded to at the very beginning, what I discovered when I tried doing this, it, it seems a fantastic idea, and the lectures are so much more fun now with my students because I don't teach them the content. I assume they've done it already, and we talk about ideas related to the content, and that is really much more interesting for me. I want my students to grow up and think like a computer scientist. I want them to think like an engineer. I want them to think like a scientist, and so in the lectures now, we talk, I do case studies, we talk about this, I ask people what they think, people share their experience, and all the time we're talking about in this situation, hi, hi, come in please. Uh, in this situation, um, how would I think, how would I approach it, and often I model it myself, I get guest people to come in, not to lecture to them, but to have discussions, and the students ask some questions, and we form panels. It's this really interactive session where we talk about what I think is important about computer science, which isn't just memorizing a whole lot of stuff, it's knowing how to think and use that stuff. But, once I started open learning, and um, open learning has the ability to collect data on everything that happens, for the first time I was actually able to see for each student how they went in accessing the material and watching the videos, because I can track exactly which parts of the videos they watch and when they watch them, and where the every mouse movement is, and what pages they read, and when they read them, and how far down they scroll on the page, when they move to the next page, how long the page is open for. And I discovered that most of the students weren't watching the lecture videos. <laughs> and most of the students weren't reading the notes. And sometimes they'd flick to some parts of it. Hi, come in. But, um, but they weren't watching. And that was a real shock to me. And I felt almost that I'd been tricked by the students. Because when I have the lectures with them, I'm saying, you've all watched the videos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if anyone's got any questions, ask. No, no, no. And we go on. And they're probably just embarrassed or ashamed or for whatever reason they're not doing it. So if you think about it, if the students don't watch the material, the whole flipped classroom idea is put in jeopardy. 
there's a danger that your students can know all the lovely high level stuff that you're talking about, at least superficially, but they don't learn the content. And for engineering, that's a disaster. They can't, you don't just want someone who can talk, they need to know the material. And unless they um, fully understand the material, or even slightly understand the material, the analysis that we do in the classroom on the material isn't so useful to them, I don't think. They can't see the issues we're weighing up when I say, well, you could write the program this way or that way. What do you guys think? And we talk it through. If they haven't seen all the content about how to write the program, they're not appreciating why we're picking that way over that way. And the little throwaway remarks I make about, of course, there's a danger here with um, uh, you know, the complexity issue and this stuff here is not sufficiently coherent. Little comments I throw away like that that relate to whole bodies of work that I expect they know, I think they can't even tell it's important necessarily. And they just... So I feel they're not necessarily even getting value out of the high level stuff, and they're certainly missing the low level stuff. So just by a show of hands, has anyone here run a flipped classroom and has, and has seen, well first of all, has anyone here run a flipped classroom in any way at all? No, no. But presumably you're all contemplating doing it? Not at the moment? No. Or you are? I think, I think it's inevitable, I think even if you're not contemplating it now, this is the way that universities around the world are going, and it's been going for about five years or more now that it's in the mainstream, and certainly some people have been doing it for much longer. I expect that soon all universities will do it, because it, it makes sense. It's, it's not the way we were taught, unless during mentoring model, an apprentice model, where you actually have interaction with the experts, and the content is disseminated in some other way. So I think it's an inevitable thing. Um, so is it still interesting for me to talk about this if you're not contemplating it right now? Yes? Or not? A little bit, maybe five more minutes and then so? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so if you're going to run the classes flipped, or if you're running a MOOC, a MOOC has exactly the same problems. Uh, in a MOOC, there is no face-to-face. -face. You have time where you can interact with people live in the MOOC. You can have discussions and conversations with them. And as a lecturer, the scaling problem becomes really clear. If you've got a class of 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, you don't have time to have intimate time with every student. Your time is your most scarce resource. So you have to make sure that you devote your time on the MOOC to achieving the maximum impact. The maximum impact is not content dissemination. That's sort of a waste of your time with lots of people. So even on a MOOC, you want your interactions with people to be of the discursive discussion type, and you want to have given them the content in videos that they watch before they engage in the discussion activity. So it's the same issue, that you want your students to have absorbed the content before the class. But the students have come, especially if they've come from high school, from a system where they've been spoon-fed. And by spoon-fed, we sort of mean they don't have to do anything, and we just do it for them like a baby. You, they don't have to go out and hunt and gather to get the food. They don't have to cook the food. They don't have to make the decisions. They just have to turn up and go, hungry. And you get the food you prepared. And they just have to open their mouth and you tip it in. And that's a sort of model that we have in Australian high schools. And probably it's a model you've got here because it's a traditional teaching model. Um, but the problem is then students come to university expecting us to have digested the material for them, made selections for them, prepared it, put it on the spoon, it's all delicious, and they just have to open their mouth. And they're not necessarily lifelong learners. They're not themselves being engaged in the learning process and taking ownership. They're thinking we'll do it for them. So, um, so when they get to university, they don't have an expectation that they'll go home and work in advance of the class. They have an expectation they'll go home and do a lot of work and assessment activities after they've learnt the materials. But a flipped classroom doesn't work like that. A flipped class works by they do preparation before the class. And they don't have an expectation of that. So how can you get them to watch the videos or learn the materials? And I think these three ideas are a really good um, start. And I think we should start with the, the one here, first of all, that it has to be an enjoyable activity. It doesn't have to be entertainment, but it can't be a chore. So if you just put up your PowerPoint slides and say, study these before the class, no one will do it. It's absolutely terrible. And, and one of the lovely presenters was talking about that. Who was that? Uh, the ca caffeine, um, Mr. Mutak Kim. Right, does anyone know him? Yeah. You remember, were you here when he was talking? His idea was lovely. He said, I went and looked at my own presentation, which was just a whole lot of PowerPoint slides, and he said, I was bored. He said, I didn't even want to do it anymore. I just flipped through. I, I didn't want to do my own class. If you don't want to do your own class, the students won't want to do it. because they're more. So PowerPoint slides are right out. So the material has to be, in some sense, engaging to the students. It doesn't have to be entertainment, but also it doesn't have to be high-quality video. It just has to be something that's not a chore for them to watch. 
which probably means breaking it into reasonable sized chunks, having the material being presented in a way that's relevant to them, having them feel part of the whole process and ownership, not being lectured at but involved, all sorts of more, more subtle things about how to construct your videos so that people enjoy watching them uh, or don't hate watching them. Secondly, um, you've got to, I think, expectation is, is the thing, that people have to expect this from the outset. So if you were ever going to introduce a flip model in a course, I think it's really important to create those expectations from the beginning of the course. Even before the course starts, maybe have material going out to them and emails about it and things so they know even before they turn up. And then right from the very first lecture, the first time you're with them, say, this is what we're doing and it's very different to what you've done before and it's utterly important you do it. And making it really obvious from the very outset to set their expectations that they expect to do it. If you run one or two weeks in normal mode and then try and flip, I don't think you have any chance of persuading the student. It has to happen right from the outset. And what I do in my, I get, I'm lucky, I get to see the students when they come into their first course at university, so they have no university expectations, they just have high school expectations. And I often get, I try and get a Monday lecture slot for this very reason, I often get their first lecture at university, and I make sure that's for me all about setting up the right expectations, because if I get it set up right in the first lecture, they don't even notice that I'm setting up these expectations and just everything runs smoothly. So I, traps, here's what I never do. I never say, we're doing something new this, ex this semester, I hope you'll enjoy the experiment, or well, I'm trialing out something that you won't see elsewhere because I want you to, I never do anything like that because that makes it look like what we're doing is un unusual. I make sure they, I'm utterly confident in what I'm doing and when I talk to them, I'm talking about it so matter-of-factly, they think, oh yeah, this must be what uni's like, this must be how it goes. I get people, uh, it was hard the first time I ran it, but then the second time, I got students from the first time, fantastic, charismatic, top students who really enjoyed the process. I get them to come back, and they're there in the first lecture with me. And, I, and they'll, they'll just, um, just be sitting down the side or something. I used to pay them to do it, but now students just turn up for fun because they've seen it themselves when they've run their first class. The former year students have turned up. So now the last, every year, the last year students tend to try and turn up for the first class just for fun. And then I say, oh, do you have any suggestions to the students this year? About, and they say, oh, make sure you watch the videos in advance because if you don't watch the videos, you're in real trouble. And, oh, this course is fantastic. But, you know, and I just try and... Um, by having the people around them accept it and by making it really explicit and talk to them about it, I try and set up this expectation that of course they do it. And then I have this notion of fail early. That's what pain if you don't do it means. That if they don't do it, there's some early failure. Engineers like that. If a system's going to break or there's something wrong about it, you don't want to find out at the very last instant. You want the system to fail early. As soon as you detect that there's a problem or could detect, you want the system to fail. Because if you fail early, it gives you more chance to pick, pick it up. So. Things like um, get them to do something after the first lecture that if they weren't paying attention, that, oh, in the first lecture, if you've asked them to watch videos before the first lecture maybe, do things in the first lecture that make them uncomfortable if they haven't watched the video. So they go out of that very first lecture thinking, oh, I'm never going to be like this again, I'm going to watch the video. So, you know, it could just be I start talking about a microprocessor straight away and I start programming it on the board. I say, oh, I hope you've all watched the microprocessor video where we talked about the rules that we sent out. Now let's write some interesting programs based on it. I'll do something. And they feel uncomfortable if they haven't done it because there's a whole lot of complex stuff we're doing on the board that they don't understand that looks really important. You can't do that for too long, of course, especially if it's the first lecture because you want everything to be a positive experience. But just enough that it's a shock that you go, now I'll continue this tomorrow uh, in the next one. Do make sure you watch the rest of the videos for this week so you can see it. And tomorrow I'm going to go and ask you guys what your best processor was that you were able to generate. <gasps> Man, that would strike fear into their hearts because they think I might even be called on to do something tomorrow. I do it in a friendly cheery sort of happy way, but they know there's a danger I might call on them and that the, the next lecture will be the same. So I think the pain if you don't do it, make it clear straight away. Not in a negative way, and I'll talk about that in a sense, in a second negativity, but just in a positive way that if, if things don't, that um, if things don't work, they realize straight away. And value from it, it's really good if after doing the, um, the preparatory material, they're able to feel good in some way if they can feel clever or smart in some way. So you can give them some problem that everyone that's on the material gets and they realize they wouldn't have worked it out if they hadn't got the material. That sort of thing, feeling good about what you're doing, feeling it had value and helped you, that's fantastic. That's a real strong motivator. And like with everything, you want to get these motivators set up from the very beginning. In the first week, people have to be thinking the right way. It's too late in the second week when they have it. Now, ways of getting them to watch the videos. I've grappled with this since 2006 how to get students to watch your videos. What happens is some students are fine and watch them. And they're students who have good self-control and good time management and are really organized and disciplined and are enjoying the course. But there's not many of those. 
a lot of the students are enjoying the course, but they're just busy people or not good with time management and they procrastinate. So what often happens, not through any ill will, is that I'll find a student who's not been watching the videos and I'll say, why aren't you watching the videos? What's the story? And they'll say something like, um, oh, I mean to, I just fell behind and I had a whole lot of stuff to do this week and I'll catch them all up next week. And, and suddenly people have an, a backlog of six hours of videos to watch in a week. And that can actually be a negative feeling for them. If we talk about negativity, I find with my students, as soon as things start going bad, quite a lot of students shut off and go into denial. So rather than fixing the problem, they actually just don't want to think about it. So once they're six hours behind, it's actually really serious. They think, this is hard for me to catch up. Oh, I just don't want to think about it. I'm going to work on economics for a while. And oh man, I should start watching those computer videos. Now I've got 12 hours to watch. Oh no, I'm going to go and watch a video. I'm going to go and see a movie or I'll go and do it. Because the problem now seems so big, there's no easy way to recover. So they just sort of give up. So I think once the students start feeling um, things are out of control, it's very hard um, for them to catch up. Now with face-to-face -face lectures, that's not a problem. Because if you miss them this week, you'll still turn up next week. Just a habit of turning up and everyone being there. So you're sort of forced to watch them next week and the week after. And at the end of the day, after three or four weeks, you just miss three lectures from week two. That's all that happens. But online, if you miss three in week two, it could mean you never watch lectures again in the course. So, um, so you have to be careful about that. So here are some of the tricks we've used to try and get people to watch videos. Trick number one, or not tricks, mechanisms, um, marks. We said, watching the videos is compulsory. There are marks for watching the videos. I'll monitor when you watch the videos. I'll um, give you the marks for watching them, and you'll lose marks if you don't watch them. All right. That didn't work. That made students stressed and angry. And the sorts of discussions we started having once marks were attached to them, they were more about the quality of the lecture videos started to move into a really uncomfortable area. So I'd say, why do I have to watch these videos? I could learn this material somewhere else. These videos are going too slowly. I want to learn. And they start to justify why they shouldn't have to watch them. They start sort of blaming the videos or blaming the course in some way. Now, all of those comments are probably really good, but you don't want them to be happening in a heated sort of mark-related environment. I don't know if your students are angry about marks. So um, my students are very focused on marks. So once I attach marks to it, I make everything high stakes and it just doesn't work. And then, of course, what I find is students claim to have watched the videos or they open the video screen, but they walk away, leaving it playing while they're not there. They do all sorts of things to trick it to get the marks, but they don't get the marks. So the actual mark watching thing, uh, giving marks for videos didn't work. External pressure. So then I tried um, indirect marks. And this worked quite well. In indirect marks, I said, in this course, we're measuring your ability to overcome procrastination and time management. It's one of the high-level outcomes of the course, is the time management skills, because that's one of our graduate attributes for our engineers. Um, so I want, at the end of the course, you to put together a one-page portfolio demonstrating that you've mastered good time management skills. And the sorts of criteria we'll be looking for in your portfolio are how many of the videos you watched, and if you watched them on time, how many of the assignments you did, and if you did them on time, how much of the lab work you did, and if you did it on time. And if you had problems, how you dealt with the problems, and how you recovered and planned for problems and got back on track. Everyone just present one page, but with links to evidence. And then it was up to them to demonstrate they'd watched the videos, that handed things in on time, and so on. And it was no longer now having to watch, the marks weren't driving them to watch the videos, the marks were driving them to have good time management, which was actually more accurate, sort of what I wanted them to have. The reason they weren't watching the videos is their time management was terrible. With procrastination and denial, they were actually getting into a terrible situation where they hadn't watched the videos by the end of the course. And that terrible situation, by the way, just before the exam, they'd try and watch all the videos in a big block, and that just doesn't work. So they'd be watching them at high speed. Everything in the videos that wasn't quite right would make them angry because this is the week before their exams, and they're wasting time watching these. And if there's something wrong in the video where you know, I make a mistake in one of the lectures or something, they're really angry about it because now they're trying to watch everything super fast and I'm wasting their time. So, uh, and of course, the skills of the course hopefully are threads that run through the whole course. They're not something you can learn the day before the exam and suddenly get it. It's too late to learn the course then. They won't come. So the indirect mark thing worked really well with the time management portfolio. That's time management portfolio. And it was up to them to mount evidence that they'd watched the videos. And they would say, how can I prove that I've watched the videos? And I would say, as with all portfolio things, what do you say when someone asks how you, have, how you prove you've done something in a portfolio? What do you say? Suppose a student said, Anna, you've asked me to prove that I've watched all the videos on time. How can I prove that? 
Do I just show you the watching logs? How do I prove I've sent them all the time? Yes, so there could be ticks, but they could tick it off by tricking. Oh, let me rephrase the question, because maybe no one's asked you. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's getting better. So <clears throat> somehow they have used the material that was in the video. So that's like secondary evidence that they've watched it because they can do something that presumably requires them to watch it. But that's a general, that's a specific part of a, the more general approach. The more general approach, it's like when someone's filling in a CV. I'm on a job panel this afternoon after I leave here where we're interviewing someone for a position. And there's all these criteria for that job. One of the criteria is have to have had leadership in education and able to lobby you know, government departments. And they could say to me, someone applying for the job, well, Richard, how can I prove that I have leadership in education and I'm good at lobbying government departments? To which my answer would be, I don't know, that's your problem. And so this is what the problem is. When the students say, how do I prove that I've watched the videos? I go, oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you're going to do it. Maybe you guys should talk together and work out ways of doing it. Some ways, I guess, and then one of the bright students will say, maybe we can show we can do things that depend on the videos. Yeah, yeah, really well done, Anna. Maybe we can show the ticks on the thing. And then someone will say, but we could fake that, man. And they go, how do, and it's up to them. And this is the whole thing about portfolios. It's a back to front thing. It's up to them to mount evidence that convinces you, just like when you go for a job. So most of the students eventually, by talking amongst themselves, work out the way to do it is each week as they watch the videos, they blog on them reflectively. And that's very hard to fake. If they've actually watched the video that week, you can see the timestamp on the blog when they've talked about it. And that's more or less evidence that they've engaged with the material and really understood it. But that's them doing it. So they're not crossed with me. That's what they've decided to do themselves to prove it. So the whole thing about portfolios is it flips the onus of proof, which is a really lovely thing to do. Um, so interrupt, Greg Marks are good. Here's another one. Um, did I tell you about the DVD trick with the Yes Minister? I didn't tell you about that. So my parents. Uh, have uh, in their house a TV. In my house, we don't really have a TV, so we don't watch TV. But we watch movies. We have DVDs, and we can display them on a screen. And there's a TV show called, back from a long time ago, Yes Minister. Has anyone ever heard or seen this show? Some of you have. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's very funny. Very funny. Um, and it's occasionally shown in reruns on Australian TV. And I have the complete DVD set of Yes Minister. But I can never get anyone interested in watching it. I say, girls, let's watch Yes Minister tonight. No, Dad, we don't want that. I want to go and look at my device. So we're up at my mum and dad's house. They're watching TV, because they still get TV, free to wear TV. And um, Yes Minister comes on. And the music's done, and whatever the music goes. And I go, oh, it's Yes Minister. And mum and dad say, oh, good, let's watch that. And the kids say, yeah, let's watch that. So they sit down, and we all watch an episode of Yes Minister together, and we laugh and laugh and laugh. And the next night, at around about 6 o'clock, the girls say, hey, is Yes Minister on again? Let's watch it again. Okay. But I keep offering this to your home. You never want to watch it. They go, no, no, let's watch it. And they all sit down and watch it. And it's really fun. <clears throat> the whole time we're up at mum and dad's, if we're there for three or four days, yes, minister every night at six o'clock. We go home. I say, girls, I've got all the yes ministers here. Let's keep watching them. And they go, ah, oh, no, maybe tomorrow, dad. I don't want to go on my door. And I thought about that. And I thought, what's going on here? And I think there's this sense, my theory is, there's a sense of loss and immediacy. If it's on at six o'clock on free to wear and you don't step into the room, you've missed it. If you're five minutes late, you've missed the first five minutes, and you won't get it back. So there's this sense once it's playing, it has this urgency attached to it, that if you don't watch it, you will lose something. Even though it's not completely rational, because you could put a DVD in. And in some sense, the girls would then, every night that it's on, watch it, because they didn't want to miss out on this thing that was only offered then, and then would disappear. But at home, a DVD you could watch any time, which in their land of procrastination means never watch it. And I thought, that's a lot like lecture videos. When you turn up to a class, if you turn up 10 minutes late, you'll miss the first 10 minutes. So you just come every day to the class at the scheduled time, because if you don't turn up, you miss it. And everyone else is doing it. It's a synchronized sort of communal activity. So there's, you're all doing it together. But with a recording, you're doing it by yourself. You, you've got them all at home. You can watch them anytime. So most people watch them never. So what I thought was, how good it would be if I could somehow have a sense of loss around a video recording. And I have a couple of ways of doing that that have turned out to be fantastic. Way number one is this. When, oh, sorry, before I get to it, I should say one little a thing that I tried was I said, everyone, you watch the lecture videos, and if something in the lecture videos doesn't make sense, we'll still get together on Wednesdays, and I'll discuss on Wednesday the lecture videos, and you can ask me any questions from the lecture videos that didn't make sense, and I'll explain them. As soon as I did that, I thought 
that will make people want to watch the videos so they can ask questions, because if you don't watch them, you'll miss out on being able to ask questions. But it had the opposite effect. Can anyone guess why? Less people watch the videos when I tried that strategy. Yes! <laughs> That's so clever. You're completely in tune with the student way of thinking, and I wasn't. So I thought, oh man, I don't have to watch the videos. He'll explain it in class. And other people will watch it and ask the right questions. So I don't need to watch it to think of good questions, because I can rely on someone else in this large group to do that. I can just come. So they turn up, and people that ask questions, I'll explain them and go, oh, I understand that, I understand that. And even if they watch the videos in the first week, after the first week, they thought, why even bother to watch the videos? Because the people that don't ask, watch the videos just ask questions about what's in them, and they get it all explained to them, and they get it in one hour, rather than have to watch three hours of videos. Now, they don't realize that there's, of course, two hours of stuff you're missing out on in that time, because they just see the stuff they are getting. So people stop watching it. So I realized I had to have a rule pretty early on, a mental rule for myself, that I will never discuss stuff from the lecture videos in the lecture. So I talk about other things and things related to it, but if anyone asks a question about the lecture videos, I say, that's a great question. I think that's in lecture two, is that right? Someone goes, yes. You should check out lecture two and ask me later on if you've got a, offline if you've got a question about it. It didn't make sense. But I refuse. Without telling them I'm refusing, I'm always cheerful and happy about it, But because that's a trap. <laughs> Once I start explaining it, everyone will think, oh, I wasted my time watching lecture two. He explained it anyway. So this idea I had was, everyone come along on Wednesday, and on Wednesday, I will show the video in class. Because then if you don't turn up, you miss out, and if you turn up, you get it. Now, a lot of students were angry when I first did this. They said, what a waste of time. He can't even be bothered teaching us. He just shows the video. So I thought, I have to show them that I'm not doing this to save money. I'm not doing this because I'm lazy, that I do love and care for them, and I'm trying to do the right thing by them. And this isn't laziness on my part. So I started doing other things around the video. So what I did was um, I'd say, turn up and we'll watch a video. And then as we're watching the video, I occasionally stop it, and we have commentary on the, what's going on. I'll say, look, th let's just fast forward over this bit. It's a bit boring. Um, I don't think I explained this well. And here, this is really interesting. Who gets that? Can anyone think of a better example? And we just sort of, it'd be a blended class with video and face-to-face. -face. The advantage of it being, if you didn't turn up to class, you could still watch a video at home. But everyone would then start turning up to class. But yet the class, I didn't have to do lecture prep or anything like that. I had a lot of the advantages of a, of, a, of a video that in terms of my time, it was great. And we got to have discussion, meta discussion about the content, but I didn't have to explain the content. So that worked out okay. But yeah. Yes. And then he has a conversation with his recording. Ah! <laughs> Can you post the link and share it with everyone? Yeah, yeah. The, I, think this is, I think this is good because um, this makes them feel, what, what my students, the first time I did it, they said, we feel ripped off. You, we're watching you teach. You're teaching another class because I was using videos of another class or whatever. We don't feel like you're talking to us. We feel like we're watching someone else's really high quality experience. We're left out. But if you somehow use the lecture material as primary stuff and you interact with it, then they think this is for them and they like that very much. So I like that idea. Um, uh, and I, I think this is the way to go, to be a bit playful like that. I like that because students didn't have to turn up, but if they did turn up, they watched it. By procrastination, they all did turn up anyway. And I mean, that guaranteed that they watched one video at least each week. I normally made it the last one in the week series, so it didn't make sense if you hadn't watched the other ones because I wanted it to be fail early. So people then had an incentive to watch the other ones before this date. To add more value to the lecture, though, when I did it, I would open another window on the screen. So they're watching it. The video's playing in a video player on my screen, which is projected up. I'd open another window, and I'd do interesting things. Sometimes i just have a chat session, just be a chat window. And people could ask me questions during the video, and I'd be chatting away. So you'd have this online discussion going on down the side as the video is happening. And that people quite like that. Um, but an, another thing I did was I used to open assignments and start marking them. So you could be watching the lecture video, but if you got bored, you could look across and you'd actually see me marking assignments. And I'd literally be marking the assignments. And they loved that because they don't normally get to see that. That's like a secret thing. But they'd get to see interesting things like um, I'd make the same comment time after time. So I'd open one and go, this is good, but you forgot this. Open the next one, and they can see me scroll down to look for it, back up, and I'd go, this is good, but you forgot this. And they'd all be thinking, I forgot that too. And I often think that if only students could mark assignments, they'd learn so much more than if, rather than just getting their own one back. If they could see the whole thing, they'd see collectively where the points of failure were. And they got to see that over and over again. So I, I thought, that, so they like that. So they like, those lectures are always packed, even though I'm just playing a video, because I'm engaging with the video in some way, and I'm doing something interesting on the side that they like. Yes? Um, by using a, a 
video. Yes. Yes, it is a distraction. Absolutely, it's a risk. But the students, if they're watching the video at home, probably have a movie playing at the same time and the radio playing. I, I no longer think I have an environment where I have their whole mind. So often they're playing Minecraft while they're listening to me and things like that. They're, they're distracted already. So what it is, is there is an opportunity to watch the video. The activity I'm doing on this side is a bit boring. For one hour, I'm just marking 500 assignments. It's the same thing over and over again. It's not as though it's so compelling that you're drawn to look there all the time, I hope. My hope is that students watch here, but when they get it and they're bored and they, they can just watch this for a little bit and flip across. I asked the students if they like it and they did like it, but you're right, I am putting a space, but at least the distraction is better than pictures of cats. It's related to the course. Yeah. So then would the video, would you be using the video for further interaction? Uh, in what way? In, in, in the, the purpose of the video, what, what is the purpose of the purpose of the video is to explain the content. So it might be explaining some complicated formula or how recursion works or how a particular data structure works. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so how I normally do it is I try and, and sort of pick up on this theme that you were talking about, that I want the experience of watching the video to somehow be richer than if they were watching it at home. So certainly while the thing's going, I'll be marking, and if there's something really complex, maybe I'll pause the video occasionally, or I'll call out comments, oh, that was rubbish, or oh, this is a good bit, everyone listen to this, I'm going to play that again in case you didn't get it. So I will interact with the video a little bit, and then I guess what I should do if there was a really key threshold point, I'd pause it and say, did everyone get that? Because that's really important. Did you see this? I didn't give this lecture very well. I didn't make it clear how important this is. I think that's the main point of the whole thing today. And if you didn't get it, probably you won't really get everything. And if you got it, I don't mind if you get anything else. It's a key point. I'm just going to replay that 60 seconds again. Watch closely. And at the end, if anyone's got any questions, put up their hand. So there's nothing to stop you interacting with the material in that way. Uh, um, and I think your creativity in a room full of 20 people or less but approximately 20 people, is 20 times greater than my creativity. Between us all, we'll think of hundreds of ways of interacting. What I was just trying to say is, I think um, <clears throat> you, you can't just give them static web, uh, a video and expect them to watch that. You can expect them to, but you'll be disappointed. And if you build things based on that, it'll fail. So you have to work out ways of making it more rich so they want to engage with it. So here are some of the ways I've thought of, and I'm sure you could think of other ones. And already, just from our discussion now, I'm getting ideas. And I'm sure you can think of other ones. I'm sure we can all think of other ones. But the important is, somehow, we can't just give them passive content and expect them to watch it. Um, so I, I re-watched the, oh, yes. Yeah, so they don't have to watch the ones that we do in class. That's right. So I, essentially, what I'm saying is, here's the lecture schedule. I give them all the videos at the beginning. And I put stars next to them. I say, this one will be watched in class on this date. This one will be watched in class. So you can watch it at home, or you can watch it in class. Yeah, yeah. So I still have some of my classes being the high-level discussions, but I have one a week where they, we just watch a video together to sort of make everyone stay up to speed. So at that point, I want you to feel like an idiot if you haven't watched the week's videos, and I want you to know you're falling behind. I want you to fail early. Um, but the, the best thing I did, or not my idea, it was um, a brilliant idea by uh, someone called David Collian. When I was explaining the... Um, the yes minister problem I was having. And I said, if only there was some way that these videos could be ephemeral, so that they could watch the video, and if they watched it, it was good, and if they didn't watch it, it wasn't good. And there was some sense that it was this, like a TV show. And he had this great idea, and it's now on open learning, which is you can set up the video to be an event. And while you're watching the video, you can just watch it normally, but at the time you're watching it, you can see a whole lot of other people, on the list of all the other people on the side that are watching it. And they're in groups. And if you want to join any of those groups, you just click on that group name, and the, the video um, position moves to wherever that group is up to. And very quick, so I tell everyone, guys, on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, I'm going to watch Lecture 7. Come and join me. You don't have to. You can watch it at home anytime you want. But if you want, watch an election. So at 6 o'clock, I start watching. People come in, and they click on my name, and that group gets bigger and bigger. And as everyone comes in, they join, join. And if three other people are watching, and they're watching together, and then they see a big group, they click. And the groups just merge really quickly. And really quickly, within the first minute or so, suddenly we're all synchronized. And that means we're all watching the video exactly in lockstep. And then there's a chat screen on the side, and we're chatting. So we're just making comments. And I'm saying, oh, this is a good bit. And did you get that? And does that make sense? But there's this sense that we're all watching it together, like we're in my mum and dad's room. And if you turn up late, you'll miss the first half sort of thing. 
and it's an external time constraint. It reminds you, oh, I should probably plan my day so 6 o'clock on Tuesday night is free so I can watch the lecture each week. So we all do it and we talk together. If you go to the videos later on, you can watch the video and you see the comment stream of all the people chatting throughout the session, video, but you can't join it. It's closed. It was just the people that were there that were part of that conversation. The people that weren't there can watch it later on. So it's sort of in their face, really, making it really obvious that you missed out. We had a great time. It's fine if you missed out. You can watch the videos in your own time. That's fine. I'm happy for you to organize your own time. But if you turn up Tuesday next 6 o'clock, you'll be in this conversation too and think, that's incredibly popular. So those videos were all watched, the ones where we synchronize watch together, just like a TV show. Now, there's no reason that can't be applied more generally in the course, and I'm thinking this year I'll do that, where the students can set up times themselves to watch it. So the whole two group say, guys, let's watch the recursion videos at 7 o'clock tonight. Then they all go along, click on that group, they're all joined, watching it together, and then they're chatting and having a private chat together as they watch it, and they're doing revision notes and things like that. But even if they're in their separate bedrooms on other sides of the country, they're watching it together. There's a sense of we're all in mum and dad's bedroom together, in lounge room together. There's this shared sense. So that I thought was pretty cool. What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, I like that. So that was to get people to watch things. Um, I think that's probably all I want to say about getting people to watch the videos. Are there any questions about that or comments? If you notice, yeah, you had a question? Yes. Yes. What's your name? Asim. Yeah. Thanks, Asim. Um, that's, I was just about to say, and then I noticed you were going to ask a question. I was about to say, notice all these techniques that I'm talking about now aren't really educational techniques. They're all really just trying to understand the mind of the students. So, because in this whole model, everything works because the students do what they want to do. We no longer can make them do things. So now as educators, we have to think carefully about what motivates students. We have to make sure what we do aligns with them. We're not trying to trick them, but we are trying to align with them. So the benefits they get from doing what we want are the benefits they want to get, and then they value what they do, and then they choose to do it. Because they choose to spend hundreds of hours on Minecraft, or on Facebook, or doing all these other things. They are in control of their own lives. Even in your lecture, they can be physically present, but on the internet, not paying any attention. They are now in control of everything. So our job as teachers now is really about understanding the students and making the most natural thing for them to be, do, the thing they want to do, making that the thing that we want them to do. And this is how MOOCs work, because in MOOCs you have no control over them at all. So unless you set it up so that their, their incentives are aligned with what you want them to do, they just won't do what you want to do. So your question is perfect, and really that's the right sort of question to be asking. First year students are motivated differently to second year students, who are motivated differently to master's students, who are motivated differently, different cultures have different motivations and different levels of expectations, and are they doing this course because it's a service course or it's a career they passionately want to do? All these things mean there's a lot of diversity. So yes, I think there's massive diversity. I think there are many things in common that we can rely on. I think at all ages people like community and being part of a community. So anything that offers community and belonging to part of a group that, where you're feeling valued as part of a group and you're a bit proud to be in that group, I think that works at all ages. I think that's just a human thing. So if you create the group of engineers doing this course or the group of people learning this subject and that's a really positive group and they like being in that group, that's a strong driver for them to come back and participate in the group and help each other. Um, but yes, I find that first year students are more compliant and sort of do what I tell them to do without thinking so much. And third year students don't want to do anything and are really lazy. But not lazy, it, I think they've just become, it might be different in Malaysia, I think they've become jaded. I think they've lost faith in university by the time they're in third year. They no longer think, this is going to be a transformative experience that changes my whole life and I'm going to be an incredibly different person after doing this. They think, in Australia, this is just like high school, it's a bit of a disappointment. All I've got to do is work out the minimum I've got to do to pass and I'm going to learn some boring stuff and go to boring lectures and do pointless assignments do group work where I feel frustrated, I'm trying to get the minimum marks I need to get to get the grade I want to get to get where I want to go. And they're just more strategic with their time. So I think that the nature of that means that you, you have certain advantages when you're talking to those groups. With first years, you can, it's really ripe for setting up expectations because they are really open to change, I think. They have high expectations of what uni's like. They've experienced high school, but they haven't experienced uni. So if you can somehow trick them into thinking, no, university is really like this, and they believe that, they'll carry that through for the three years. So I think first year is a good time to bring about change. So if you're going to bring about a change in any of your programs, I'll try. I think third year, when they're jaded, 
they're really inspired by anything that's inspirational because they've seen so little inspirational stuff and I think secretly we all want it. And Mushtaq does this brilliantly in engineering. He gets the third year students to do projects which they couldn't really believe they could pull off at the beginning. And at the end, they're, they're so proud of themselves for pulling it off. And he really is converting them into these passionate engineers that suddenly love engineering because they're overcoming problems they didn't think they could overcome. So I think uh, third year students, if you speak more to idealism, I mean, absolutely, they're more cynical, so they won't listen at first. But if you could really make them believe that what they're doing is actually going to change them in some way, is going to help them, is going to be profound in some way, and they're not getting that anywhere else at uni, I think they would fall in love with your course infinitely, infinitely more than all their other courses and put all their energy into it. So I think they're yearning for that. Um, they're also more busy and uh, time poor in third year. So what I do for my third year students is I tend to have a lot of case studies which are based on industry because they're starting to think there'll be an industry next year or the year after. I get lots of guest speakers in who are either former students who are now a year or two out or who are industry and they come back and I'm trying to make them believe that this course is somehow linked in a really fundamental way to their life after they've left university. And if I pull that off, if I get enough people coming in and we're just talking casually and they just think, oh no, this isn't an ivory tower course. This is a course that, if they start thinking, what do I want to be like two years out? What do I want to be doing three years out? If they're starting, having to, sort of starting to think those thoughts and your course is helping them with that, then I think that's really powerful. And I don't think first years are so interested in that. First year. So absolutely, I think they're all different. Yeah, so I think their time management skills um, aren't good. Um, uh, are you saying that they get better? Yes. 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 Uh, I find um, the time management skills of my students is really is really disappointing to me when I first saw it. Um, because I have all these hopes for what they'll do, and then I see themselves shooting themselves in the foot, we call it. They're, they're causing it themselves an injury accidentally. Um, they're missing out on their potential of how they could go, and of course, just because of stupid decisions about what they, how they devote their time to studying and how they interact with others and things like that. So I think time management, for many of them, is their biggest problem. Rather than understanding the, the content, it's actually understanding how they work as people and, and manage their time. So we've made it, like I was saying before, one of the graduate attributes that we want our students to have. And we explicitly teach it in the course. I get all my students to keep reflective journals where they have to reflect on their time management throughout the whole thing, throughout the whole course, their experience in the course. They have to talk about when they're in trouble, the plans they have to um, fix up their trouble and to bring it back on track. And through open learning, one of the reasons we wrote open learning in the first place to get the measures in their face every day for how they were going. So if their time management started to slip off the rails, they realized early, and failed early, they realized early, this is late, this is late, 20 things are late. This is... So um, I, I get them to reflect on it and blog on it as they go. And then at the end of the course, I get everyone to present to everyone else how their time management went. Not for that course, but that's all videoed, and then I show that to the next course from the beginning. So I try and use each course to generate artifacts going back. I think the only person that can fix their time management is them, so I can't fix it for them, but I can point them to good resources, which is normally just students who have succeeded in the past who have good ideas, and I can make them realize that it is a problem they have, because they tend to be in denial, and then I can reward them for good time management. Um, so I, I believe, I really need to ask more questions of my students for how effective it's been. And that's a pro we're currently doing a skills audit where we're trying to see how do we actually know we're giving them the skills that we're trying to give them. Um, we think we are, but how do we know? But um, I think with time management, I think the biggest block for the students is they think time management is all about getting everything done. That's their notion of time management. And because at university, just like in life, you can't get everything done, if you're at all ambitious, hopefully you're trying to do more things you've got than you've got time to do. And if you're not, what are you doing, man? You should be doing more stuff. Um, it, it's not actually possible for them to do everything. And time management, in my take on it, is more about constantly reflecting on the relative importance of things and making strategic trade-off decisions. So um, I don't actually, in the time management, and I think that's the biggest change for them to get. And how I try and 
get them to understand that, rather than panicking and giving themselves burnout and psychological problems because everything builds up and they don't know how to deal with it and then they implode. Um, I, I, for example, um, and I show portfolios from last year to the next year, and I always try and pick some portfolios of students who failed in some way, but who nonetheless got full marks for time management. Because I say, if, you, if your father died halfway through semester, or your house was burgled and your, internet, your laptop was stolen and had all your notes on, or you suddenly got glandular fever and you're out of action for three weeks, these are things that are beyond your control. So you're not going to lose marks for time management for these things. I say, in fact, you're so lucky in a way that you've had this obstacle for your time management. When they come to me saying, I think I'm stuck for my time management, I'll never get a mark. I say, no, no, you're in a better position than most people because you've ha now had a problem. Now you can demonstrate how you deal with that problem. You obviously can't do everything in the course because your time is now reduced. So you need to think really carefully about what you're going to do and when you're going to get it done by. And as part of that, part of that, you're probably going to talk to your tutor and work out plans, and you're probably going to talk to other students, and you're going to consult widely, and you're going to reflect on your plans, and then you're going to set um, a series of ideas about how you'll recover, and then you'll monitor your progress on those things. And maybe you'll decide you can't do assignment two, you'll only do assignment three, and you'll only be able to do even numbered lab questions. And you'll consult with your tutor to make sure you're not missing any important ones. And, and if you have a setback and set a reduced target, and then and it's the best target you can think of to, with your available resources, and then you can meet that target, that's an HD for time management. And someone else who watches all of the videos on time and all the assignments on time, they're just going to get a credit or something. You know, because they haven't shown they're good at time management. They've shown they're good at organization skills and they don't have much on in their life, but they probably should have gone out more with friends and not handed some assignments in, really, you know, in the scheme of things. So I, I think um, the thing with time management is just getting them to understand what time management really is and then having them constantly reflect on it and share practice with each other. So our portfolios are all visible to everyone else, so everyone can see what everyone else is doing for time management and how they're going, what their reflections are, and students can like what other people are doing. So with peer voting, very quickly the good portfolios ripple up, and you can find people who have had terrible things happen in their life, who are struggling to get by in the course, who make a good plan for how they'll best recover, and other students see that and are amazed by it and start supporting them with comments and liking it and saying, man, you're an inspiration to me. Good luck. Let me know how I can help you. And the whole community sort of gathers around these people. And time management then becomes, I think, a positive emotional experience rather than constantly having this aspiration you can't meet and being disappointed in yourself. It's really about doing the best you can. And I think that's a change in, in how you think about time management. And I think the first years find that very hard, going back to your initial start of the question. And it's really up to us by being explicit, by sharing practice, and by being really supportive, I think we can channel it. And it, off, it just tears my heart when I see how badly they manage their time and how they miss out on good things because of it. So I really want them to change that. That was a very long answer. It, it didn't really even address your question completely, but it, yeah. Are there any more questions? Yes. Without giving assessment or assignment to students, how do we know that they have expected that intellectual well? Yes. Whether the matter teachers come across or not there and then. Yes. Other than they, they have to check or some with no time, they will they don't have much time. They will not even check whether yes. they understood the well or not. That's a really good question. So I certainly wouldn't suggest you um, activities after content to check the content. If I've said I haven't done that in the past, I've probably not ex explained what I've done. I don't have, are you talking about this thing I have of not assessing work? Yeah. I, yeah. Actually, we assess all their work. I think that's really important. It's just not for summative purposes, not, not for their final grade. So everything they do is assessed, but it doesn't contribute to their final mark. I think this fail early thing is really important because students, especially boys, are very confident, are overconfident. So they will think they understand something long before they understand it. <laughs> and they'll be completely convinced they understand it. So you need them to fail and realize they haven't understood it. So if I was teaching um, a new microprocessor and how to program it, and there was no activity for them to do as a result of that, I wouldn't be doing a good job because they will think they get it before they do and they'll move on. So they have to be, I think they need to reflect on what they've learned, they need to try it out, and if it's failed, they need to fix it. So the reflect is I get people to write notes on the lectures as they happen, and everyone shares their notes with everyone else. So everyone can see everyone's notes. In fact, we write them on a wiki and they collaboratively write, echo the notes. So 
if you've got a misunderstanding or a misconception, it's visible on the public notes where that is and people have discussion about it. So that's a partial answer. But then as soon as possible, and I think immediately after learning any content, students need to be able to apply it. And maybe it's with a simple quiz. I mean, I don't like overuse of quiz, but maybe it's after watching this video. You, I always, at the start of uh, a thing, think after doing this, you should be able to and think what they can't do before. So after doing this, you should be able to answer a question in this form, or you should be able to do this in under 10 seconds, or without a calculator, or something like that. And then ask them to do it before the video, have the video, ask them to do it after the video, and they'll see if they, if, so that's a good fail thing. Um, I like activities, so quizzes are good because they're quick. So you can have a quick quiz after every video, but make sure that it doesn't lead to the same problem that we had when I explained things, and then people thought, oh, I don't have to watch the video, because he explained it. If you have a quick quiz, it'll only be superficial, and you can probably only ask about three things. So if you've got a, a lot of content coming out, and you ask three simple things, the boys will go, yeah, I got that right, hey! And they think they understand it all, and they'll move on. And they only understood three things out of it. So um, I like having questions that people get wrong afterwards, but you can't have too many of those that they're depressed. But I would never want someone to get full marks after watching a video. I'd like them to get nine out of 10, and they think, oh, I nearly understood all that, but gee, I didn't get 10 out of 10. What was wrong? And have some more subtle questions that they have to go back. Um, I think quizzes are OK, but I would combine that with a range of other activities as well that test knowledge at a deeper level. So I really like people applying knowledge, not just being able to recall it. So if I taught them a series of new microprocessor things, at the end of that, I'd say, here's a virtual microprocessor. Write a program to do this. And now they actually have to do something, and it's evident to them if they can do it or not. It's not submitted to a quiz who says true or false, some external oracle. It's evident to yourself. So if I say, write a program to make the bell ring six times, if they can't do it, they know. They don't have a program that makes it ring six times. If they write the program and the bell runs six times, they know they've done it. So somehow activities that use their knowledge. I talked about the Mandelbrot set. Did I talk about that before? I got the students. I taught them how to write a web server in C. I taught them the mathematics for generating the Mandelbrot set. And I taught them how to generate an image file. These were three different pieces of content in the first year computing course. And then I said, write a web server that when people um, request a particular area of the Mandelbrot set, it returns that web tile as an image. And I gave them a little app that stitched them together like Google Maps. So it would draw a picture of them. Amanda Brot said it's just like a map of, of something, a map of maths. It's, it, it's an image. It's, it's an image you can get. The set has an attractive view. And so the students knew straight away if they could do it. If you didn't get the complex maths or you didn't know how to make the web server work, you didn't generate the image. And once you could do that stuff, then you had this beautiful program that generated these absolutely beautiful images. But the the students then had themselves as the judge. They were the assessor. So they would be disappointed they couldn't do it until they can do it. And when they can do it, they feel so good and so proud that they can do it, that they like it. And what I do after activities like that, unlike quizzes, is I, as soon as you've done it, I say, post what you've done. So with, with that, this activity, within um, a day of it coming out, people started posting these beautiful pictures of the Mandelbrot set. It appeared in the course gallery. And as everyone was posting pictures, I'd say, oh, that's a beautiful one. I'd be commenting on them, and I'd be posting them in the thing a day, and I'd be saying, vote on them, guys. Pick the best one from your tute. I, we should have a tute you know, uh, a competition where each tute finds the most beautiful picture they can. And so everyone's now doing it, and it's really clear to you you can't do it if you can't do it, because you can't do it, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I, I like that sort of activity. You've got to pitch it right so people don't lose heart. You can't have something that's so hard you can't do it and people get demotivated. But I like, when I've taught them some content, get them to do something with that content that generates something that's an artifact, like an image, and then get people to share the image and hopefully have the image have some qualitative nature to it so you can be proud of the image you've made rather than everyone just producing the same thing. Uh, so yeah, I think as soon as they learn content, they should do it, be tested on it straight away. Not to tell me, but to tell them that they've got it right or they've got it wrong. And especially if they're boys, you need to tell them really bluntly they've got it wrong. And, and once they know that, they'll go back. That's why Minecraft's so popular. You try and build something in Minecraft, you get it wrong, it doesn't work. And boys go, well, oh, I want to make it work. I thought I understood that. No, 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 no. I didn't get, it's still not working. Because you can see you've got this visual feedback straight away whether it's working. So I think this fail early thing is absolutely important. So all, yeah, sorry if I gave the impression of not to assess things. I don't like having marks as a driver. I like them producing beautiful pictures to be a driver or feeling good about themselves to be a driver or feeling uncomfortable. They can't do something that everyone else can do to be a driver. But I don't like the marks to be a driver. I want them to do the thing because they value the thing, not because if they do the thing, I value the thing and I'll give them a mark and they value the mark. I want them to like the thing. Did that 
and yeah. That was a very long answer for a short question. Did you have a question? Too frightened now. Yes. South of sea. Yes. 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 Yeah. Did everyone hear that? Yeah, yeah. Self. Self. Did you want to speak into the mic? Uh, yeah. What's your name? Maybe. Maybe. Dave. Um, she was summarizing what I said. And I think your added value it wasn't just summarizing, it was adding your own contribution. I think it's absolutely correct that um, it's, it's a lot about self-esteem. Because the students only do what they want to do. We can't make them do things. They're the only ones that make them do things. And if things are going bad, they do pro what we probably all do, and they withdraw into themselves and think about other things. But if we can build their self-esteem so they feel good about themselves, so they like doing this thing they're doing, and it makes them feel proud of what they're doing. So everyone wants to build their self-esteem, and now building their self-esteem hopefully is aligned with our goals, which is increasing their understanding of this thing. I, I think that's absolutely magic. I think that's spot on. And marks are not good for self-esteem. Marks are people measuring you and saying, I'm not as good as you. He's not as good as her. She's not as good as him. And none of you are as good as that. For me, marks are all about turning people into numbers and comparing them. And people are these wonderful, rich things. Only one person can be really happy if you compare everyone and put them in a long list. Maybe 10 people can be slightly happy, and one person is going to give up and never come back, and maybe 10 people. So every one of your students is a rich, complex person who's fantastic at some things and hopeless at other things. And if you squash it into one dimension and just have one number, you're missing all of that. So I like activities where no matter what sort of person you are, you can find something in it that gives you self-esteem. So this, this Mandelbrot thing, some people could be proud they solved it quickly. Some people could be proud their image was more beautiful. Some people could be proud that their code, because everyone shared the code, their code was clearer and people loved their code. So people could be proud of different things and everyone could find something in that to, to be proud of. And the most beautiful pictures I gave prizes to, and I changed the course background. I don't know if you've ever seen the open learning background for the course, but it's always a picture from the Mandelbrot set around the time of that assignment. And every day I find the best picture that I love, and I make it the course background. So that you know your whole class of 500 people going to that course are looking at your picture, because I love it so much. One student from Thailand last year found a picture of an elephant inside the Mandelbrot set. I don't think I've ever seen anyone find a picture of an elephant in the Mandelbrot set. It was just amazing. But there it was, an elephant, bright as day. It's the most beautiful thing. And so I praised that student, said how amazing that was. And that student was so pleased. And they've come back this year to help other students in the course. But self-esteem, I think, is exactly right. The students are precious, but flawed human beings like us all. And they will only do what they want to do and what they're motivated to do. And if we make them positive, enthusiastic, and loving uni, they'll put all their time and effort into uni. And if uni's a bad, negative, or nasty place, a place where you don't feel good about yourself, or you feel you're failing in some way, You'll try not to think about it. You'll, de you'll devalue it in your mind. You'll put it down in your thoughts. And you'll put your time into doing other things, being on Facebook, looking at pictures of cats. Or... Yeah, so I think that's a perfect thought. Does anyone else have something they want to say? A summary of an idea? Yeah. Ask a specific. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Some specialty subjects and philosophy. But for us, you know, the architect that uh, uh, even our traditional education system yes. was based on, for example, we have two hours of lecture and yes. six hours, seven to eight hours. Yes, design lab. Yeah. Yes. So we, we didn't get the advantage of this. Yes. Learning as much as other subjects. Yes. Yes. So, That's a good comment. Did everyone hear that? Some disciplines like for example architecture, they've already sort of gone down this path. More apprenticeship model, I think, is how architecture is normally taught, that you have masters around that people emulate and you have little discussions with the masters and things like that, rather than massive content dissemination like a physics lecture with 500 students in one lecture. So I think what that means is you are already doing the right, a good thing already. So maybe you, um, uh, you don't have as far to move as, as say science or first year mathematics would because you've already got this apprenticeship model. But I still think, um, I still think you can, the, the, teach, the practice of teaching architecture can be improved in the same way that the others can be improved, which is, 
And architecture has so much scope for this. Students love architecture. It's already a blend of quantitative and qualitative. They produce things that they're proud of and they exhibit their work to others.